Jen's All right, folks, let's talk about the uh, impact on the economy. Unemployment claims have skyrocketed more than three million uh, as a result of the coronavirus. Uh, that is a huge part of that $2 trillion stimulus bill. Joining us right now is Benja Ajilore, senior economist at the Center for American Progress. Uh, glad to have you, uh, Benja. First and foremost, this bill that was passed, we heard, we, we heard lots of people talking about it's filled with for stuff for corporations, $500 billion. Um, let's, let's do with small businesses. Small businesses is the engine that drives America. Are small businesses actually being helped in this $2 trillion bill? So there's a provision about $350 billion that's going to go directly to small businesses and that's supposed to help them. Um, there could be more and it could be more stuff that could help out small businesses, but there is something in that $2 trillion bill to help out small businesses. So $350 billion going yes. to small businesses. What's the 500 billion going to major corporations? So that's for industries and try to help them out for, so you think about the airline industry, cruise industry, hotel industries. Um, one of the things about the original Senate bill is that it was a no strings attached. Um, a lot of people like to call it a slush fund, but the Democrats have pushed to make sure that there was some sort of independent oversight over where that money's gonna go. But that was uh, stuck in the bill. Um, and so, okay, so, so, we, so we have that. Um, Break this bill apart. You talk about two trillion dollars, so that's five hundred billion going to industries, three hundred and fifty billion going uh, to small businesses. That's eight hundred and fifty billion. All right, so let's talk about the other one trillion and uh, one hundred and fifty billion dollars. So, what is the, the other things are, are that's outside of businesses is looking at workers and families. So, one of the biggest things is direct payment assistance. So, that's twelve hundred dollars that goes to every uh, individual. Um, and then five hundred dollars for any dependents that you or any children that you have. So that's something that kind of help like provide a base for individuals for when they go through um, a layoff. Then the other important thing is unemployment insurance. One of the things that's supposed to happen when you have a recession is that unemployment insurance kicks in and to help tie people over to kind of ease their burden. Now over the last couple of years, about since the Great Recession the unemployment insurance has become more restrictive. Less people are eligible for it. The amount of money given to people has gone down. And so what this bill, one of the good things that this bill does is that it shores up, it strengthens and expands unemployment insurance. And it adds also what's called pandemic unemployment insurance. So people who lose their jobs specifically because of the COVID-19 virus are gonna get help. And so people who are say like gig workers, self-employed, that's gonna help those people out. And then we also have Another uh, factor called short-term compensation. So people who don't lose their job, but have their hours reduced, who were normally not eligible for unemployment insurance, are now gonna get some benefits to help tide them over. That's gonna help us weather the uh, storm. Uh, when, you had all, when you had all this nonsense that was being said by uh, various people, uh, Lindsey Graham and others, uh, they were complaining uh, about people who are uh, gonna make more money on um, uh, on uh, unemployment. And it, it was strange listening to the logic uh, of Tim Scott and Lindsey Graham talk about that. It just didn't make much sense to me. I'm trying to find this uh, clip I, I posted earlier from Tim Scott uh, talking about that. The only Af the only black Republican, uh, obviously, in, in the United States Senate. And, and it, it, it was just, again, it's sort of weird to me that here you have a bill and you're trying to help people and they're complaining by saying, well, because somebody might get a few extra hundred dollars one time that, oh my God, let's shut this whole thing down. Uh, it doesn't make any sense whatsoever. You know, that was strange to me. It was strange. Now, granted, they finally backed off. Scott backed off. Uh, Graham backed off. Both still voted uh, for the bill. In fact, uh, here's a sound. Go to my iPad, Henry as fast as possible. I am in support of the legislation. This drafting error made me pause for a moment. The key to understanding the drafting error is kind of simple. We cannot, <clears throat> we cannot encourage people to make more money in unemployment than they do in employment. Uh, as an example, in South Carolina, the average unemployment or the maximum unemployment is about $326 a week. The way we understand the legislation the 326 on top of that would be $600 a week. Said differently, someone can make about $926 a week. The way that the legislation is written, the person who makes less than that would make that anyways. So you would be able, to, uh, 
a person who makes $20 an hour times four, $800 a week, uh, could get about half of their income up to $326 for South Carolina. And then on top of that, they would get an additional $600. So it doesn't, the legislation doesn't envision the ability to have uh, someone pick $10 an hour or $15 an hour or $20 an hour, uh, getting a maximum of 100% of their income. This legislation would not stop at 100% of your income. This legislation would allow you in unemployment to make more than you do in employment. We know that that is a drafting error, and we are simply providing an amendment to fix that so that you do not make more in unemployment than you do when you're working. Well, uh, uh, Benja, one of the problems here is that, like in South Carolina, folks are being underpaid. You're Republicans who have been at against $15 an hour. And so t to stand there and, and to hear them whine about this, when, you, when, when you're literally setting aside $500 billion for cruise industries that are not based here in the United States, for airline industries, and for companies that engage in stock buybacks who are sitting on tons of cash. So you used the word before the clip, weird and strange. I would use the word offensive. Because what you're saying is that people don't want to work and they'd rather be unemployment. And it goes into this whole trope about people who are poor, which is, it, it's, it's just offensive. And so the problem is, this is not a drafting error. This is, and this also misunderstands the whole problem and why we have this crisis. This is a public health crisis. To stop the spread of this virus, people have to stay home, which means they can't go to work. If they can't go to work and can't earn, what are they going to do? So this is what this whole purpose of that extra $600 is specifically for people who lose their jobs because of this virus. And people are staying home so that we don't spread and that we don't kill other people. And so the whole purpose is this is not a drafting error. This is something to get people to stay home like they should. And then that way we're able to combat this virus. And so what that $600 does is that helps people to continue paying their bills, continue paying their mortgage or utilities, take care of that stuff. And then once this public health crisis ends, they get to go back to work because people are going to want to go back to work. And the other thing is, what they're saying is that, oh, these people are going to want to, are going to make more money on unemployment, so they're not going to want to work. If you quit your job, you don't get any unemployment insurance, so it's moot. So it was just the fact that this came up and it became a talking point through all throughout yesterday was just really upsetting and offensive. Um, anything else in this bill that, uh, first of all, let's talk about the education piece. Uh, again, you had Republican Matt Getz uh, bitching and moaning about Howard University getting 13 million, but there are dollars in here for a number of education institutions. Right. So the, I mean, funny thing about Representative Getz that he picked out on Howard is that Gallaudet University also got it, and he didn't mention anything. Yep, yep. I, I, I tweeted that last night. He didn't respond to that at all. And Gallaudet is one of the other universities that's chartered by the federal government. Right. And the thing about Howard is that it has a hospital, and it's actually they've taken care of COVID-19 patients. So that's where that money goes to. We're also talking about $13 million. That's chump change. We're talking about $2 trillion, and you're going to pick out one institution and focus on them as opposed to any of the other kind of the slush fund. And so it's just kind of ridiculous. But what was important is that, you know, you think about distance learning and that how some people are, don't have the access to broadband, don't have the access to do distance learning, but yet everyone has to go home, stay home and still do school. And so some of that money is gonna help with that and help get people to be able to continue telework, uh, maybe even telemedicine or even distance learning education. So all that money is very important. And we still there's still more that needs to be done. So hopefully the House will pass this tomorrow, get the money into the economy, get money to help people out, also to help combat this public health crisis. But there's more that we can do. Last thing, is there anything else in this bill that, that people need to be aware of that you think is really good for, uh, for, the, for the everyday person who's watching us? I think the important thing is what I like about this bill is that it's not one silver bullet that, you know, they talked about there's a big discussion about those payments. So the twelve hundred dollars, and everyone said that's not enough. And it's right. There's, it isn't enough. But you put that on top of the unemployment insurance. You have the short term compensation program. You have the pandemic unemployment assistance. And so you add all that together. You have the three hundred fifty billion to real small businesses that you know, help out with loans and grants so they can take care of things because they're losing out because of this public health crisis. And so a lot of the stuff we need to talk about in our policy discussions can't be either or. It has to be both and. 
And so keep doing more, keep putting stuff on top and helping out workers and small businesses. All right, then, Benja Ajalore, senior economist uh, at the Center for American Progress. We appreciate it. Thanks a lot. Thank you. All right, folks, let's go to our panel. Dr. Greg Carr, he's the chair, Department of Afro-American Studies, Howard University. He's got a couple of books in his library. Uh, and Reese Colbert, Black Women's Views. Glad to have both of you here. Uh, is Erica there? Let me know if she's there. Uh, is she there? Okay, got it. Okay. So, so let's, uh, I want to start with you first, um, Greg. It's very interesting when you, when you look at uh, all the conversation ar around this bill. And this is also why it's important to have black economists and to have shows that put folks out there. Because, again, I've been complaining uh, this, this, the, since this whole thing started. You ain't seeing black economists, black doctors, black nurses. You ain't seeing none of that. That's why, that's why we're here. But to hear that breakdown, Greg, to have a, an economist talk about why this bill is important, just your thoughts. Brother, as you said, this is the space for black people to get their news. You had one of my former students on yesterday, a very important Fatou Sal. You got a direct black report from Italy. That's exactly right. And so again, support Roland Martin, Roland Martin Unfiltered. But Brother Aji Lori really broke it down. Uh, unfortunately, with Senator Scott, the drafting era is his time in the United States Senate, brother, because you're right. They pay such a low wage in South Carolina, which was Bernie Sanders' point the other day, that it looks like $600 is a lot of money. But as he said, let's just let's just go through the numbers. The average American worker makes about $1,000 a month. If my uh, colleague Bill Spriggs were here, you've had him on many times. I'm, I anticipate you're going to have him on again talking about this. You know, it's about $1,000 a month. Unemployment runs about 40 to 45 percent of that if you're on unemployment. It, you can run for as long as, as 26 weeks. Let's run the numbers. In Alabama, you can get only up to $275 a, a week in unemployment. In California, $450. In New Jersey, $713. So when you add $600 to these numbers, ultimately that means in Alabama you're getting far less. Now, you have other provisions. If you are living in a federally owned facility or federally financed facility, in other words, if you're fearing that you're going to get put out because you can't pay your rent, if the feds hold the mortgage, there's something in the bill that says they cannot evict you. That's very important. If you owe a student loan, they've suspended those payments and they've suspended interest accruing. That's very important. If you're, if you're thinking you're going to get loan forgiveness because you're involved in public service, they have said that while they're suspending your payments, they're going to still count the months that you're uh, not paying toward that uh, forgiveness. That's important. There's a lot of good stuff in there. Val Demings did, I think, a very good job in terms of tweeting some of this stuff out earlier. But in terms of the black perspective and where this really comes together, I think what we heard from our brother uh, Ajilori is very important. These states are wildly unequal in terms of the things that they provide to their uh, citizens. When you see this fool Tate Reeves in Mississippi, I I'm reminded of something a man you had on this uh, on this show many times, Adam, Adam Server for The Atlantic. He says, you know, white supremacy is a suicide pact. This man is going to take a whole state down for him. And meanwhile, the governor of Florida is saying, if you come from New York, we're going to put you in quarantine jail. The states are now beginning to separate out between the states where the governors and the leadership are caring about the citizens and the states that are going to throw all in behind this ideological foolishness. And that's where we get finally a real challenge, because as Governor Cuomo said yesterday, he does not want to be in competition with other states trying to outbid them for ventilators. And he said, when this thing breaks and passes us, we're going to send some of these ventilators to the other states that need them. Meanwhile, the White House, with their daily Trump rallies, is sending mixed messages and increasingly the public, led by the media that's not under the thrall of Trump, is beginning to turn away from the White House and towards state and, lo state and local government. Bracey, when you look at... Uh, these responses when you when you hear Dr. Burke say, oh, we don't have a shortage and they keep saying what they're hearing from on the ground. I'm sorry. I I'm looking at videos of nurses and doctors talking about uh, the difficulties they're having. I mean, I, I was engaging with a, a doctor earlier who was talking about uh, the problems when it comes to masks, things along those lines. In fact, uh, I'm going to play a video uh, in a moment uh, where uh, Jamal Bryant uh, their church had gotten uh, some uh, a thousand uh, coronavirus test, but they had to be, they had to partner with the hospital. They couldn't find anybody to partner with. Go ahead. Yeah, I mean, at this point, Dr. Bricks is 
simply a propagandist. I don't think that she's trustworthy with looking at things that she's saying. I mean, she's talking about this rosy scenario that involves testing that on a level that we're clearly not doing. The restrictions on who gets tested is so um, so restricted that we can't even trust that we have any kind of pulse on how many people are truly infected. She's touting the fact that 86% of the people that are tested are testing negative. Okay, but you're testing such a small portion of people. New York is doing the most testing throughout the country, and we see astronomical numbers coming out of New York. California is doing such a small fraction of the testing, and yet they are still seeing increases in their infections. Uh, people have said New, York, New Orleans is the new epicenter of the outbreak. And so I just don't trust what Dr. Brooks is saying, and I really hate to say that, but she's just, I, I just don't consider her trustworthy because she's talking about uh, scenarios in other countries where they have places like Italy who has done extreme social distancing, who has locked down the country completely, and they are on people's ass about staying at home. And meanwhile, we have Trump talking about a beautiful Easter with packed churches, and we have this disparate responses between different governors, these red state governors that are like Mississippi, the governor who is overriding local ordinances and things like that. And so I just, I don't trust what she's saying. And what's really frustrating actually is seeing the, dis the to me, the increasing disconnects we're seeing from even what some of the governors are saying. Governor Cuomo today in his press conference said that they have enough PPE for now. And yet what we're seeing from um, actual reports from hospitals is a completely different picture. And so at this point, it's hard to understand who to trust, what to trust. Or should we trust the things that we're seeing on social media, the direct reports from the hospitals? Should we trust what the governors are saying? We definitely shouldn't trust what the Trump administration is saying. But the cases are growing, the mortality is growing, and I'm just at a loss as to what is actually really happening. All right, folks, one of the issues that uh, we've been, we, we were just talking about uh, this $2 trillion stimulus bill and the amount of money that's in it for educational institutions. HBCUs, like many universities and colleges, have been greatly impacted as a result of the coronavirus outbreak. Uh, universities have shut down. Uh, my niece, who's a freshman, had to pack her up, move her out of her dorm. Uh, she's back home uh, in Houston. And so how are they faring? You also, of course, uh, know about uh, Congressman Matt Gates of Florida, who's been getting his ass kicked on social media uh, because he had the, he dared have the audacity to question uh, to question why Howard University was getting 13 million in the uh, bill that was passed by the Senate last night. Go to my iPad, Henry. This is what he tweeted. $13 million in taxpayer funds could be going to families across the nation struggling to put food on the table in the midst of COVID-19. Instead, it's going to Howard University. Education is, a mu is important, but a $13 million check to Howard does not belong in COVID-19 relief. Now, of course, he talk he's talked about in here, that in the bill it says for an additional amount of, uh, for Howard University, $13 million to remain available through September 30th, 2021 to prevent, prepare for, and respond to coronavirus domestically or internationally, including to help defray the expenses directly caused by coronavirus and to en enable grants to students for expenses directly related to coronavirus and the disruption of university operations, provided that such amount is designated by Congress as being for an emergency requirement pursuant to Section 251, blah, 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 blah. Joining us right now is Wayne A.I. Frederick, who is the, uh, Dr. Wayne A.I. Frederick, uh, who is the president of Howard University. He's also a medical doctor. Uh, Dr. Frederick, glad to have you here. All right, thanks for having me. All right, so for the for, so for folks out there, first of all, folks have been kicking Matt Gates' butt. Uh, Congress, Congresswoman, excuse me, Senator Kamala Harris, a Howard University graduate, uh, she fired back at him. I hit him back by saying he said nothing that Gallaudet University, uh, which is a university uh, for the deaf here in D.C., they also are getting funds uh, in here, but he chose to single out Howard University. So explain to people uh, out there uh, why Howard is getting the $13 million. What, what could it be used for? Is it used for university operations or the hospital? Go right ahead. Sure. So a couple of things. One is that Howard and Gallaudet are two non-military institutions that are in the uh, federal budget. And so there's a separate line item in the appropriations that goes to uh, both institutions. Both universities federally chartered under President Abraham Lincoln in 1864. 
and Howard eight in eighteen sixty seven. Yes, go ahead. Uh, signed by President Johnson, ironically the first president to be impeached. But the point was that when those institutions were when both institutions were founded and supported by Congress, as we go forward into the nineteen twenties, where the Congressional Act that started that that um, funding, when there's a, a bill like this. We do not participate in Title III funds at Howard, as the other HBCUs do. So in order to make sure that whatever unusual expenses we may have in an emergency like this, you actually have to write a line item or else Howard would not participate. That's one. Two, how the return on investment the country has been getting from a Howard University is critical, and especially in this particular crisis. Howard University is responsible for sending more African Americans to medical school than any single institution in this country. And then when you talk about the research side, as you look for a vaccine, you, you talk about the neighborhoods uh, that are, will be disproportionately affected. And you talk about the economists, you talk about the sociologists in this country, where they're coming from, where those PhD folks are going to come from. Howard is at the forefront of doing that. 49% of my students are Pell Grant eligible, although we have a private institution. And so this displacement that has occurred as a result of the, the, this pandemic will adversely affect them and their families. The chance that these students will be able to come back is going to be adversely affected. And yes, we do run a hospital, which is a division of the university. So it means that when I look at the entire um, enterprise that I'm running, I have to make decisions between resources that go to the university as opposed to the hospital. Uh, we have four COVID um, positive patients that we have admitted to the hospital today. Uh, we have five in-house that are suspicious, meaning that we've tested them, but we don't have results back. And so those numbers are gonna to begin to grow. We're not even on that upswing yet, as you see in New York. So those resources uh, come out of everything that we do for our students in the, uh, in the entire population and our faculty and staff as well. So, so it is a complicated situation. I'm not sure everybody understood that Howard does not participate in the 1.05 billion part of that bill that was assigned for HBCUs and MSIs. But also, again, so, so explain to people also uh, the role that Howard University is, the hospital is playing uh, in DC. One, it's a trauma center, but also explain to people it, the role it's playing when it comes to COVID-19. It's a level one trauma center. Um, we are a COVID-19 um, institution in terms of providing acute care, and we're beginning to see people coming in um, with symptoms, so we have to rule those people out. And you have to remember, until you know whether or not somebody is positive, you have to treat them like they're positive when they come in with a pneumonia. Uh, you know, we had a gentleman come in recently as well who basically had symptoms of a bilateral pneumonia. Um, was tested positive for COVID uh, at another institution, was told to go home um, and worsened and came into the ED. We have to, all of those patients, you're using medical equipment to guard against uh, your employees getting ill. And so it is a, a significant amount of resources that have to go into this. I think one of the things that people keep missing here is that this is a very highly contagious virus. And so you have to take that, that much more precaution as you interact with these patients, even if you just suspect. And then also we have to make sure that our healthcare workers on the front line do not contract this disease. Because once we start losing people on the front line, you then have really stretched resources. We've been talking about ventilators and all of those things uh, for some time. But the reality is everybody that you put on a ventilator, you now need a respiratory therapist to help you manage that ventilator. Doctors and nurses, while they may understand the settings and can change the settings on a ventilator, they are also doing so many other things in giving the care to that patient. You need respiratory therapists. And so all of those things, all of these are areas that I think are being overlooked in terms of our healthcare system. And quite frankly, Howard has been a pipeline for that. Or if you look at all the African-American physicians in this country, Howard still is, has, is responsible for training more African-American physicians in the history of medicine in this country than any other institution. Just want to uh, clear, you said uh, that there are four positive coronavirus patients at Howard University Hospital. That's correct. Um, last question for you, uh, Dr. Frederick. Uh, for actually, a couple more. First, how has this virus impacted university? Obviously, 
classes have been canceled? Are they canceled for the, excuse me, not canceled. Have you gone to online for the rest of the semester, meaning students will not be returning to Howard University for the, for the spring semester? That's correct. We are completely online. They will not be returning for the rest of the spring semester. At some point, we'll also have to assess the summer session. Um, but it has affected everyone significantly. You have faculty who were teaching um, courses face to face and they had to quickly ad adapt to online. And I'm very grateful for the faculty um, that we have because they've done a great job of doing that, of making that switch. Administration staff as well has really supported us getting that done. Uh, the students are significantly affected. You have students in different time zones. So you may have a student uh, in Nigeria who is taking a class uh, at a very odd hour and is getting up at a very odd hour. So all of those things are inconveniences. We had to also mobilize funds to get students who were displaced to get them home, buy them plane tickets in some cases, gas cards. Um, and we still had to house some students who could not get home. And so we're paying those leases uh, for some of those students to stay at a place in Maryland. So there's, there's several things that are infected. We have research that's been taking place. We can't draw down on those dollars. So that's going to be a major revenue hit on the university as well. And we are finalizing a policy around providing refunds um, to students and appropriately so uh, for room and board that uh, charges they incurred. So that's revenue that we're going to give back um, to the students. So all of those things are going to affect us uh, on the bottom line. And then there's the psychological impact. Uh, a lot of these students did not plan for uh, having this as well, and nor did the faculty. You have faculty with responsibilities at home in terms of child care, et cetera, who are trying to teach, but at the same time trying to homeschool and provide and take care of their family. And then we do have members who actually have now lost um, a, a family member to uh, the COVID epidemic, pandemic as well. And so there's a lot um, of impact, I think. Uh, and I think in the long term, as the economy begins to deteriorate further, uh, you're going to see even more impact. And usually that in fact impacts the lower part of the socioeconomic bracket. And when you have 49 percent Pell Grant students, we know we're going to have retention issues. We're going to have issues with students who want to come back. And when you look at the entire landscape of the HBCUs, we all are going to be affected, especially the smaller HBCUs. So my brother and sister schools, we have to look out for them as well. And we stand up several programs in the summer to act as a pipeline to get them into med school, law school, grad school, dental school. And now we may have to do that virtual, in a virtual setting. But I'm also very worried about our brother and sister HBCUs as well. Uh, last question for you. You are a medical doctor. What are you hearing from your medical friends uh, who are being impacted at hospitals and private practices by coronavirus? Well, I, I, I don't even have to tell you what I'm hearing from my friends. I can tell you what I'm seeing. I'm still a practicing surgical oncologist. I was in the hospital on Monday to see a couple of patients with new cancer diagnoses, one with a liver cancer and another patient with a stomach cancer. And I tell you, it's, it's difficult. You don't want to use too many of the resources in an elective setting. So I had to have tough conversations with both patients as to when we will schedule their tests and their operations uh, because I'm not sure when the surge may occur. And we want to be careful that we don't necessarily bring people into the hospital who may end up on a ventilator when we need a ventilator for someone else, or for that matter, somebody who may be immunocompromised. And although we're all taking all the precautions, you don't want to spread that coronavirus, coronavirus from one patient who comes in uh, to another patient who's having an elective procedure. So it's a very complicated situation. It's putting a lot of stress on the system. We also are, are having... Uh, physicians and other healthcare workers contract the virus. And once that happens and that workforce begins to, to thin out, it is very, it's, it's going to add a lot of strain and stress on the system as well. So right now, in my opinion, things are really um, stretched. I, I, I kind of heard parts of the conversation before in which there's some conversation as to whether or not we're hearing the right things. And yes, there may be more ventilators than are being used, but the fact of the matter is we have to be prepared for a surge. And we are using a lot of resources to get there as well. At the same time, we're not doing elective operations. So our hospitals are not bringing in the types of revenue, et cetera. All of those things are gonna have a long-term impact and the stimulus bill certainly does try to address some of those things. All right, uh, Dr. Wayne Frederick, president of Howard University. We surely appreciate it, thanks a lot.
Thank you. All right, I just want to go back to my panel here. Greg, uh, look, you were a professor there at Howard University, uh, chair of the department. Uh, again, uh, you, you, we have seen HBCUs, but also other universities, as well as high schools and middle schools and elementary schools, having to on the fly figure out how to teach folks uh, when, they're not, when, they're not, when they were not set up for online learning. Absolutely. And again, this is why Roland Martin and Unfiltered is so important. Wayne Frederick's not only the president of Howard University, as he said, he's a practicing physician, one of the few of the country, maybe the only one who's also a college president. And uh, it's very important to hear from our brother talk about the on the line challenges, because I'm hearing from friends who are on the faculty of Morehouse School of Medicine, for example, and Bahari in Nashville. And, you know, who have admitting privileges, who now have their students who are on the front line of this. And one thing is for sure. Through these black institutions, what you're hearing from the people on the front line, as Dr. Frederick has said, those, those front line people, they're hearing that, you know, the, there's an under report. Even now, we still don't know who all is sick, who has tested positive as it relates to the faculty. Absolutely, man. You're talking about, look, I'm a classroom teacher and have been for 30 years. For me, I've had to move my face to face classes completely online. Now, it's been a smooth transition. And I'll tell you, this is an advantage that we have at black colleges. Um, through Zoom, I'm using Zoom for my what they call synchronous instruction, meaning real time face to face instruction. Um, I'm listening and I'm getting reports from all over the country just from my students. I have 240 students in one class, 100 in another. And they're telling me I heard about what was going on in New Orleans from the students in L.A. You got people still going to the beaches. My students are like, what the hell is wrong with them? In New York State, you're hearing these stories. So that's one thing. But the faculty's real challenge, finally. And this is not just faculty at HBCUs, but all over the country, but specifically at HBCUs. When you don't have an infrastructure that's set up to go online immediately, and let's be clear, you're not talking about online instruction for classes that were designed to be online. You're talking about an emergency short-term measure to get us through the end of the semester. You're talking about a heroic act. And I'm not just talking now about college professors. I'm talking about all of our K-12 colleagues who have been slammed with something that seems like it's almost impossible. A nation that is now about to engage in social promotion for the entire K-12 student body in this country. They're gonna, they've suspended standardized tests. These professors are asked, not, not college, these high school, middle school, and elementary school teachers are asked to do online learning when many of them have students who don't have computers or access. And so I guess in summary, what we're faced with is a nation of educators that are now front and center in what should be a deep reminder of the importance of teachers in this country. So when we're past this, don't anybody screw up their face and say, you know, why are we paying these teachers? Why are we talking this, this, this union? Why am I paying this? No, you better thank a teacher because everybody's finding out what teachers do now. Uh, that is definitely the case, uh, Reese. Uh, it's a whole bunch of parents who are like, oh, Lord, teachers, can y'all please take these kids off my hands? Yeah, I think we absolutely have to salute the teachers, Dr. Carr, people like your professors, like yourself. They're doing a phenomenal job. And I mean, like Dr. Carr said, they're having to adapt on the fly. The parents are having to adapt. The students are having to adapt. And we can't forget the students that are being left behind because they don't have access to the resources. You know, rural broadband is an issue that people have throughout the country. Black communities don't necessarily have the same access to these um, resources in order to adapt to this online learning situation. But going back to what um, Congressman Matt Gates did, you know, it's really interesting. You know, the, the Republicans are always looking for a boogeyman. You know, China is the boogeyman with Secretary Pompeo insisting on having the Wuhan virus or the coronavirus being called the Wuhan virus in the G7 statement. Now they've moved on to black people or now they're adding black people onto the boogeyman. The fact that an elite institution like Howard um, University and Howard, Hospital, Howard University Hospital are the targets of people like Congressman Matt Gates. It's also on Fox News and it's, it's permeating social media. The fact that people think that black institutions are not worthy of literally anything because what Howard got was 0.04% of the monies allocated to hospitals and universities. And even that was, uh, you know, too much for some people to, to take. So I'm just really sick of the fact that we're supposed to be uniting as a country and yet the black folks always have to somehow be the boogeyman or the target in these situations.